The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Powell fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypowell.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have on the podcast with us today? Today, we are delighted to welcome Chrissy Kistler, who is a geriatrician researcher um, in the Department of Family Medicine and Division of Geriatrics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Chrissy. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. And we're delighted to welcome Scott Bauer, who is an internist and geriatric urology researcher in the Departments of Medicine and Urology at UCSF. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Scott. Thanks, Alex. Super excited to be here. <laughs> we're going to be talking about all things lower urinary tract infections, lower urinary tract symptoms. But before we get into this topic, does someone have a song request? I do. Um, this is uh, in, it, can I tell you about why I chose it? Yes. This is in homage to my children who I sing this to them on a not infrequent basis and also the lower urinary tract. And we would like to request, let it go. <laughs> oh, very appropriate. All right, here we go. <laughs> Snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footstep could be seen. A kingdom of isolation, and it looks like I'm the queen. The wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in, heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in, don't let them see Be the good girl you always have to be Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know Well now they know Let it go, let it go I can't hold it back anymore Let it go, let it go Turn away and close the door and I don't care what they're going to say Let the storm rage on The cold never bothered me anyway Yay! Very uh, apropos, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Amazing. I, I want to know from both of you, uh, urinary tract symptoms, how, like how... <laughs> How did you decide, like, this is going to be my focus of research? Um, and uh, yeah, Scott, I'm going to turn to you first. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, I get the question a lot. Um, and so I trained as an epidemiologist before medical school and started out studying prostate cancer. And something that I learned and then started to study afterwards was that men with prostate cancer um, use the future effects of uh, treatments on urinary and sexual function to drive a lot of their treatment choices. And so um, that was one, very interesting to me. And two, I then went on to study um, lifestyle risk factors that affected those outcomes. Um, and in my medical training, becoming a primary care doctor, I realized that older adults, women and men, um, were having a lot of these same symptoms. And unfortunately, a lot of our treatments have modest efficacy. So that really motivated me to start studying them um, in older adults, um, which is what I do now. That's oh, fascinating. Great. So I I actually got started in cancer screening also, um, thanks to some mutual colleagues, very interested in um, decision-making around, uh, you know, as we get older, individualizing care, sort of patient-centered, values-driven. Um, it's a tough decision to figure out, like for me, my N of one, um, is it a good idea to get screened for cancer or not? And so 
really am fascinated by tough medical decisions. And um, interestingly, uh, infection control in older adults is also a really challenging medical decision. So it's a really hard nut to crack in terms of what is a UTI? What isn't a UTI? What do I prescribe? How do I do deal with it? What do I work up? And has profound harms to people in terms of if we don't get it right, that is we miss a UTI, they get, get urosepsis, they die. On the other hand, we give them tons of antibiotics, they get C. diff, they get massive resistance, they die. So it's kind of this really challenging decision. And that's that's why I'm interested in it, but very few people also are necessarily as fascinated by this. I, I am I am super interested in this topic, um, and just uh, so many questions I, I have to ask. I'm going to start with some basics. So, Scott, um, a lot of your stuff is on lower urinary tract symptoms. What, what does that encompass? What is that exactly? Yeah, so um, it is an umbrella of symptoms that occur anywhere from the start of making urine all the way to the point of finishing uh, urinating in the toilet. So it can be symptoms that are, occur while you're starting to store urine in your bladder, but you're um, having sensations of urgency or spasm. Um, you are not storing urine uh, successfully. You're having leakage of urine. And then when you start to void, you're having uh, any number of difficulties with that process. You're having trouble initiating uh, urination. Um, the flow is extremely slow or starts and stops. Once you think you're done urinating, your bladder still feels like it's full or you feel like you have to go again within you know, a, a unreasonably short a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, that entire spectrum is called the lower urinary tract symptoms um, and affects low, um, older women and men um, at increasingly high rates as, as they get older. And how common is it in the, like, the elderly population? Yeah, so older adults uh, between a third and a half um, have some uh, clinically significant degree of lower urinary tract symptoms, depending on how you define it. Mm -hmm. So very common. Mm -hmm. do, and do we know, is it associated with any outcomes, like bad outcomes, or, yeah, or is it so, just a nuisance? Um, the listeners are probably well aware that urinary incontinence is one of the kind of classic geriatric syndromes. So um, once that receive that label, there was a lot more studying of bad outcomes um, that occur after someone develops urinary incontinence. But what a lot of my work has been doing is trying to shine a light on all of the other lower urinary tract symptoms to um, uh, increase awareness that um, older adults with those symptoms are also at higher risk of mortality, as well as um, what we'll kind of get into in the paper that we're discussing today. Um, uh, ADL limitations and mobility limitations. Can I ask what's the Venn diagram between urinary incontinence and lower urinary tract symptoms? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in women, it is very um, overlapped. Um, there is a small, it's much less common for an older woman to have bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms to not have some degree of incontinence, whether it's stress or urgency or mixed, a little bit of both. In men, there is a lot less overlap. Um, and for a lot of my... Um, so I don't have a number for you, but I can tell you that the, those circles start to separate in, in men. Um, but both are prognostically likely similar of similar importance. And then as we, we talk about Venn diagrams... You know, probably the most common reflexive thing that providers do when they hear about lower urinary tract symptoms is they check a UA. They may send a culture. How do, how do urinary tract infections fit into this picture, Chrissy? Yeah, so that's, that's the problem, right? So we have this kind of ocular ordering reflex. We see a worrisome nitrite and leukocyte esterase and we order the culture um, like that. Like you don't even think about it. Yeah. Um, and the, the problem with that is that we will find asymptomatic bacteria. Bladders of older women, particularly older women, less so for older men, are likely colonized. And the older we get, 
the more likely they are to be colonized. And so this is not talking about our healthy 30 year old lady's bladder, not talking about a pregnant bladder either. We're talking about an older woman's bladder. We know that there is bacteria in there. And we know that if we treat that bacteria without the presence of infection, we will cause more resistant bacteria in the future so that that when they get an actual infection, we'll be left with significant drug resistance and likely a nastier infection. And we Mm. do not improve outcomes. We do not improve mortality. Well, can I ask, uh, I'm struggling with the idea, like what exactly is a urinary tract infection? Like I remember Tom Finugate had a great article about using air quotes around urinary tract infections because <laughs> um, uh, yeah. we like A, the, the bladder is not sterile. So if you actually, it, there is a microbiome of mm-hmm. the urine, like w- yeah. we just don't run sensitive enough tests in, in most yeah. people. It may be an imbalance of that microbiome that causes symptoms. And I think about it like the skin, like I can culture my skin and I can pull up some bacteria, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have a skin infection. Right. So how should how I be thinking about that with infection. the bladder? Like you if know- I... You know you have a skin infection when it's like red and pussy and it's like spreading up your arm, right? So that's what we can look at the bladder. Like if I don't typically have dysuria and I start to have dysuria, if I don't typically have urgency or frequency and I start to have those things, that's a clue that there you might want to suspect a UTI. It still isn't 100% slam dunk. I've seen lots of ladies with chronic incontinence issues who get a, a dermatitis, a chemical dermatitis, and now they get pain with urination. But I look down there and I'm like, that is needs some TLC and we've got to put some cream down there and life will be better. We don't have to give you an antibiotic. Um, or, you know, they get fecal impaction and they're constipated and now they're having incontinence because their bladder can't do what it's supposed to do because they're constipated. So we, we have to make sure we're not having a premature, like, oh my gosh, again, that sort of reflexive uh, must be a UTI, but really the, those lower urinary tract signs and symptoms should be driving your diagnosis. That is really what you need to be looking at. If it's new onset dysuria, urgency, frequency, incontinence, pure, for men, urethral purulence. Um, but there's still debate there. If you look among like the greats in the field, like Stone and Loeb and you know all of these, they don't 100% agree. There is not perfect overlap. So, so it's those, not- you just mentioned a bunch of guidelines. Is that right? That's right. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I'm just also thinking about outcomes. You you mentioned earlier, uh, we talked about outcomes of lower, lower urinary tract symptoms, outcomes of urinary tract infections. I think Tom Finucane also argues that for a long time, we we didn't use <laughs> antibiotics for urinary tract infections. Like people get over it. Um, uh uh, and it's not necessarily just because we start somebody on an antibiotic and they get better. It's that the antibiotic helped. Mm-hmm. Do we? Is it the same thing with lower urinary tract inf- symptoms? Do we have a good idea of with, I guess, infections? What actually helps with them? Is does everybody need an antibiotic? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the answer is if you're basing it off the culture, so the culture grew back bacteria, then yeah. probably not because those are probably not real infections. I okay. think our big issue here is we've got this kind of gobbledygook of people who probably have serious you know, lower urinary tract disease. Uh We have people who are going to be at risk for getting upper urinary tract issues and getting septic, right? Because that's what's on the line, right? Sepsis is the boogeyman in the room. Nobody wants anybody to get septic and die from urosepsis, Mm -hmm. right? But then there's probably a good 50, 70% of the population who gets labeled as having, again, air quote UTIs that don't. And all what, what they have is like, you know, maybe they're a little dehydrated. So their urine smells kind of funny, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. they are having pain. And so they're not making it to the bathroom in time. Um, There are lots of other things that might be going Mm -hmm. on that we're going to ignore if we label everybody, oh, this Mm -hmm. is just a UTI. Can I just reiterate what you said? Because that's remarkable. 
50 to 70 percent of people who are diagnosed with UTIs probably don't have a UTI. Is that right? And that's in the nursing home population in particular. Mm -hmm. It might be lower, like 30 percent in your outpatient clinics, but okay. it is a huge chunk. Yeah. All right, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to pose a couple questions to you then. You got a call tonight. I'm on call. Uh, nurse says, one of my nursing home hospice patients starting to have some foul smelling urine. Hospice? Yeah. But there's, okay. there's, they still have months to live. So okay. antibiotics still aligned. And like, it's a UTI. That's not comfortable. Sure. What you want to know what I would do? Yeah. Just foul smelling urine. Foul smelling urine. Foul smelling urine is not a sign or symptom of a UTI. They need they need to increase their hydration. Are they not eating and drinking well yeah. enough? Maybe it's the asparagus that they ate for dinner. Well, so and you can monitor, right? So we don't abandon people. We don't say like, yeah. okay, no antibiotics means no nothing. What we should say, yeah. this is what you do. What we should say to our nurses is, thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I appreciate that information. I want you to monitor their blood pressure and their vitals, Q shift, which you know maybe we don't normally do for our hospice patients. And I want you to push fluids on me. And if they spike a fever or they start having any other stuff, I want you to let me know. Yeah. And we can we can do something about it at that point. And I really liked your article in JAGS because it had a nice flow diagram and like an algorithmic approach. Um, and I'm just going to describe it. It starts off with a change in a resonant condition. Can you tell me what that meant? That meant, means it's what our nurses come to us with. It's like she's acting different. Yeah. And then they tell you what the difference is. Great. So that could be symptoms in a patient with dementia, maybe some delirium or off. And then the next Mental one is... Mental status uh, changes, decrease in their PO intake, you yeah. know, their urine smells funny, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So the next thing you have is negative leukocyte esterase and negative nitrates. Like, do they are they negative or are they positive? Is, is that kind of where we should go next, or should we tease out the symptoms a little bit more? Right. So the issue is that why it's kind of like a D dimer, right? Yeah. Negative nitrate, negative leukes is so rarely going to be a bacterial infection in your bladder yeah. that it's a good thing to say, oh. Okay, whatever you're about to tell me, whatever lower urinary tract signs and symptoms you're about to tell me, maybe it's not that. The yeah. problem is, is that if you get caught in the trap of it's a positive LE and positive nitrate, now you got a rabbit hole you're going down. Yeah. Hmm. So I've always heard that it's a good indicator whether or not the culture is going to be positive, but that's it. Yes. Great. That's exactly right. Okay, and then you go to symptoms. Do they have painful, difficult urination, new worsening frequency of urination? Um, and that also tells you, kind of leads you down that path. So we're starting to think it's not just the culture, right? It's not, or it's not just the uh, leukocyte esterase and negative nitrates, the UA. It's also, okay, let's, let's dive into the, the symptoms. So what symptoms would, I guess there's, you said there's some also not agreement on what counts as a symptom. Right. So there's been a lovely effort, I think, in the past five to 10 years to kind of get some expert consensus because that is as good of a level of evidence as we have. So my algorithm in that article is really based off the work Van Buell and et al. have done yeah. um, to take experts in the field, like those names I said before, pull them all together and see if we can get through a Delphi process to some agreement. Um, because that's frankly as good of a gold standard as we have. So some localizing symptoms, where does delirium fit into those non-localizing? Yeah. Right. So obviously if you have systemic signs or symptoms, uh -huh. that's important to know. So if they're tachycardic and hypotensive, if they're, you know, um, having really frank delirium, the problem is, you know, a lot of our patients, particularly in the nursing home, have some degree of cognitive impairment and they have good days and bad days. You know, if the neighbor down the hall isn't sleeping well and is making a ruckus, then my dementia, I'm not going to sleep so well. So now my mm -hmm. behavior might be a little off. And so trying to, to tease out the mental status changes piece, I think, is hard. 
Yeah. Um, but but if they have some of those true delirium that we think could be, you know, a, a really a definite change in their mental status, you know, we know delirium is a cardiac equivalent. It's like having a heart attack. It needs to be worked up and deserves to be looked yeah. at. I think a lot of times, though, it's this like, well, she's just a little off today. Yeah. And, and should we think anything different about people with indwelling catheters? Oh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Those people, you know, re- really for them, because they're not going to have a, as many lower urinary tract signs, and sometimes they may, like they may say, gosh, yeah. it hurts more here. Or they may have more CVA tenderness. Really for those people, you know, God forbid they have a fever. If they start having rigors, stuff like that, you just need to pull the trigger and start something. Mm-hmm. If I was on call from a nursing home and uh, I wanted to ask the nurse to check for costovertebral angle tenderness, how would I walk the nurse through that? Yeah, so I think you could say, you know, when you go and examine them, if you could, one, you want to check for suprapubic tenderness, so push right above the the pubic bone, right down low where the bladder is, and then I want you to feel in their back kind of in their lower back on the sides uh, of their like lower back and just kind of tap tap it for me and see if they have pain down there. Mm-hmm. That's how I would do it. I don't, there's not been a, a study of looking at how best mm-hmm. to ask that, but that's how I do it. So this is a complicated pathway, right? Mm-hmm. So you're trying to integrate the patient's past history. Like, do they have these symptoms all the time? Mm-hmm. You're trying to, you know, include information from symptoms in a population, also in a geriatric population that may have multiple reasons going on. Then you're trying to include some lab lab data, including a UA to help inform whether or not it's likely or not likely um, a UTI. How good are clinicians and nurses in, in following these guidelines or diagnosing you I mean I hear it's overdiagnosed. Right. So we're when we took for our study, not to get too like technical, but we wanted to see um, in some hypothetical situations, these aren't real life patients, these are hypothetical patients we put together. And we said, given this hypothetical patient that has all those things you just talked about, lots of information in there, do you think they have a UTI or not? Um, And what we found is when we compared it to the guideline, they were pretty good at saying when the guideline said it was a UTI, that they had a UTI. They were less good at saying when the guideline said, no, it's not a UTI, saying, no, it's not a UTI. And in fact, in a lot of cases, they said, oh, no, that's still a UTI. Hmm. So there was that overdiagnosis that's happening. Do you remember any of the examples? See if I can get any of them right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know. Challenge us. Challenge our challenge our listeners. Well, right. So, so the you know the, we took every single one of those and we made thousands of scenarios that we put okay. people through. Oh. Um, so it's it's hard. I can't. You know, I can make one up for you. Yeah, make up can. a make up a hard one for us. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull up the example we used in a study we we did. Okay, okay. you. Get a call from, you receive a, imagine, imagine, you receive a telephone call from the nursing home about the following resident. Um, The resident is an 80-year-old man who has been in the nursing home for the past year. They have no history of UTIs or current indwelling catheters. They've had reduced intake of food and liquids. They are sleeping more than usual. They have new or worsening odor. They have a body temperature of 97.5. They have a new redness on their leg. They have a positive leukocyte esterase, positive nitrites. Urine culture is pending. The family asks you for an antibiotic and their goals are limited additional interventions. Would you say that they have a UTI? So uh, I'm going to ignore the smell of the urine because that could just be some dehydration. The only localizing symptom that we have, I believe, if I remember correctly, is potentially something going on in their leg. 
So I have a I have a diagnose that is potentially more likely what's causing this person. So I'm I'm not even going to use air quotes around urinary tract infection. Great. And what will yeah. happen is people will say, oh, they've got a change in odor and yeah. I'm going to prescribe it. So when you were saying something going on with their leg, are you talking about the redness? Yeah, the redness yeah. And the, on their physical exam. They've got uh-huh. new redness on their leg. Right. So in this case, you would treat with some, uh, you would clean the area and treat with some cream. Or figure out right. what's going on in the leg. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Is it is it they're having worsening heart failure and they've got some lower extremity edema? Are they developing chronic venous stasis? Like, do they have a fungal infection? Like, again, you're going to go down that rabbit hole of skin and soft tissue. You're yeah. going to get away from the bladder. So, I mean, I think it's important take homes is really we want localized symptoms, not reflexively just ordering a UA and culture and recognizing. The UA mainly tells us if the culture is going to be positive. And just because they have a culture positive doesn't mean they have a urinary tract infection. I've been hearing this for a while. Like, um, yeah. And it sounds like it's still an issue in nursing homes. Is there anything we can do to improve this? Uh, that is a great question. I feel the same way. I think that there's probably a lot we can do. I want to involve our pharmacists more in this process. I think that they can help nudge us in the right direction is part of my hope. There are some ongoing trials to look at that. I think that um, using the culture results as a flag, you know, uh, to stop. You know, if it comes yeah, back... The problem is the- culture results don't come back until like day number three, right? That's right. Or- and what we find is people don't stop the antibiotics, they start. We've got to learn how to stop some of the things that happen. Yeah. Mm. So I think people need to get much more comfortable with reevaluating with watchful, that watchful waiting piece we do. Yeah. You know, pushing fluids, checking vitals. Let's see if we can clear up whatever this is. Let's give it a little tincture of time. You know, if we see any sign of a fever, okay, we'll prescribe. So holding back on prescribing. Also, um, we tend to prescribe like fluoroquinolones. I know we all, we don't in this room prescribe fluoroquinolones, but there is a lot of fluoroquinolone prescribing. Everybody goes to Levaquin yeah. um, and that's bad. It's bad for our patients. It's bad for resistance. It's bad for C. diff uh, and we need to stop. So having, um, when people come into your nursing home, maybe you, this is something we've been thinking about doing in ours is, you know, you say we are an antibiotic um, steward nursing home. This is what that means. You may find it's different because there's this whole culture that these people have aged into for decades of every time she gets a little off her food, we're going to give her an antibiotic. Well, can we say you're coming in here? We're, this is a bit of a culture shift. Can we help families as well as our nurses and everybody get there? Mm-hmm. It, it's going to be a multi level intervention. It's going to take efforts at the point of care with prescribing. It's going to take efforts on the family side. It's going to take efforts, you know, with system management and and getting the labs, you know, making sure people are going to stop antibiotics that that don't need to be potentially started in the first place. You know, that whole process has to be better tuned. Yeah. I want to move to you, Scott. Yeah. You know, a, do you have any thoughts on the conversation so far before we dive into kind of some of your research? I do. Well, uh, one, I just um, I thought about this before today, but even hearing Chrissy talk about it more, the challenges of treating lower urinary tract symptoms in older men have a lot of overlap with treating symptoms of urinary tract infections in older adults in nursing homes, and yet our la our diagnostic tools are even more limited. I would say the harms are probably less, so maybe that's okay. But the uh, tendency to assume what seems obvious and just go down that road and ignore everything else, I think is very strong and in a a very similar way to treating, you know, positive UAs or um, kind of non-specific symptoms of urinary, possible urinary tract infection. So, um, yeah, uh, th- that's kind of what I was thinking about when Chris was yeah, well, What? So I, I, again, I'm going to do a hypothetical. I get 80, 80 year old veteran comes to your clinic, n- new onset of some lower urinary tract symptoms. 
do you have like a script that goes through your head and kind of how to ask kind of more about that in a way that people are actually going to give you uh, real answers? And uh, I mean, this is a hard subject to talk about. And then um, how you think about the workup? Sure. So taking a step back and thinking really big picture, the, the, the first, I think, is the fact that 80% of 80-year-old men who die and get an autopsy have BPH um, is, has really driven the fact that when someone, an older man comes in with urinary symptoms um, and there's no really other obvious causes, we'll get into kind of what, what I rule out. Um, it is so easy to just assume it is an enlarged prostate that needs to be shrunk or relaxed or um, targeted in some way to relieve the symptoms. And I think that that assumption is what a lot of my work is trying to kind of undo and mm. bring in all those awesome, that toolkit of an internist to, to, so to think more broadly and to avoid um, treatments that are not beneficial and potentially causing You're harm. You're not just going to start everybody on finasteride and tamsulosin right away. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of the, my... That's like the... Uh, that's the... Yeah. Chris's uh, antibiotic. <laughs> the don't don't, equivalent. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Don't just reach for that prostate-specific medicine. So what I do do, though, is I ask, um, you, know, you know, things like we do with any new symptom... When did it start? How long has it been going on? How has it been changing over time? What was going on at the same time that the symptoms started? What are other associated symptoms? Comprehensive review of symptoms of systems. Are there signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection? And are there other red flags um, that uh, require a more rapid workup and treatment? Is there hematuria, um, gross hematuria, or a history of microscopic hematuria? I do a chart review. Um, or a history of stones, uh, kidney stones. Uh, have they ever had acute urinary retention? And uh, when they describe symptom, you know, are they having symptoms of acute urinary retention right now that they, but they're focusing on, you know, a subset of the symptoms. I also review all of the urinary symptoms from dysuria. So storage symptoms um, from like episodes of urgency and frequency during the day and nighttime. And are, is it one more than the other? Um, uh, are they having urinary incontinence? Um, going back to, for a long time, urinary incontinence was not asked about nearly enough in older adults, women or men, patients, sometimes that's the last symptom that they bring up. They, they might bring up another urinary symptom instead. Um, and if you don't ask, mm. you won't know. Mm. Um, and then all the but way that's to- That's a great point. I love that point. You don't ask, you don't know. Yeah, that's key. And that's one and of those I'm, symptoms too that can affect a lot. Of, like you hear about folks who no longer go out, they go to the movies because they're worried about that, but they may not bring it up in clinic. Totally. And um, to kind of expand on that, not only, you know, there's a bunch of other symptoms that I also ask about, but um, I also ask, how is it affecting your life? What is it preventing you from doing right now? And, it, and how is it preventing you from doing it right now? Is it that you are, you feel like there's something wrong and so you're, you feel sicker and less healthy and so you're not doing things? Is it, practically speaking, preventing you from um, going out and exercising or going to the movies or spending time with family because you're worried about being away from a bathroom? Um, or are there certain things you're doing that make it worse? And, um, you know, thinking about triggers. Um, so that's a kind of scattershot where do I start. Do you use something like the AUA score for like symptom severity? And Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> There are a couple. Not of Scott, things. the researcher, but Scott, the primary care provider who has to see another patient in fifteen minutes. If I have refilled it in the room that I'm, you know, printed out and it's right there for me, and I, it's not going to take a bunch of extra time, or I can really quickly ask um, uh, somebody that I work with to help me out and print it out for me and, and bring it. Uh, or I have patients, you know, fill it out while um, yeah. if I have to step out of the room. Um, I I do think that it is extremely helpful to know one how the symptoms that they're describing to you map on to clinically defined categories of severity. Yeah. It also is extremely helpful for tracking changes over time. Um, and there's a built-in question about how bothered they are. So if you forget or it's not a part of your practice to ask that, mm. um, it really gives you a good reminder to think more holistically and also think about mm. how practically it's affecting the patient. So you ask all these, these questions, you get a good history 
Um, and then you prescribe finasteride and tamsulosin. <laughs> oh, we skipped so many steps. So um, uh, I am really big on um, a, a thing that I have become very passionate about is urinary symptom, lower urinary tract symptoms being the initial symptom of another condition. So it's UTIs is one, and that's why we get uh, UA and all uh, men who are c- coming in with new uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. But heart failure and polyuria from poorly controlled diabetes, any sort of volume overload state, when someone is collecting fluid in their legs, it stays there all day. They don't have any urinary symptoms during the day. They lay flat to go to bed. That fluid does go back into the circulation. And so suddenly there is more fluid available to be filtered and to go into the bladder and make you wake up in the middle of the night. So I'm not there, thinking about that as a repositioning fluid shift. Exactly. So um, I really like to take a step back and make sure, um, have we thought about all the other conditions that are secondary causes of lower urinary tract symptoms? And then I think it would take too long, but there um, are a lot of different approaches to prescribing BPH medications. And I'm someone who likes to uh, try, see how the symptoms change, then see if stopping the medication makes the symptoms come back. There's huge placebo effects mm. um, that are really hard to you know detect and know what to do with. But oh, starting so like and stopping an, medicines is a really good way of uh, identifying those. Like There's an also regression, trial. regression yeah, to the mean. Regression mm-hmm. to the mean, right? That's exactly. And so what if is you, that? The, <laughs> that's where people report things at their worst, um, but it naturally fluctuates over time. And so it'd get better whether or not you treated it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a dot phrase in Epic that you can use. Um, I, and we have one that we stole from like our urologist for the AUA. So I don't know if there's other people who might have similar things out there. Uh, and do you, are you, real quick too, because uh, I want to get to your JAG study. Um, are you doing like bladder scans and m- more testing outside of some like basic labs? Yeah. So our VA clinic doesn't have uh, urophlometry uh, available on site. Our urologists have said, send anyone, we'll happily do that, whether or not we're, you know, they're a part of our clinic. Um, Uh We do have post-void residuals and I use those frequently and am pretty surprised to know kind of nationally how little they are used uh, to work up uh, older men with lower urinary tract symptoms. The the main reason being that one to to see if they have uh, severe urinary retention uh, or overflow incontinence. Um, also, if someone has nocturia, it's because and you think that um, relieving a, a bladder pro- a prostatic obstruction will help their nocturia. You're saying that because you think that the bladder is not completely emptying and they're going to bed with a partially full bladder. Mm-hmm. That is a very easily testable hypothesis with a PVR, which is readily mm-hmm. available in clinics. So mm-hmm. we, I definitely don't uh, prescribe any BPH medications to older men who are primarily concerned of about their nocturia if mm-hmm. they don't have um, some evidence of retention. Before we get to your paper, yeah. can I ask, like, what, what are the most common medications that are associated with lear- lower urinary tract in- infect- uh, uh, symptoms in men? You know, causative uh, medications. Yeah, Alex just wanted to start an antibiotic right there. He's all, that's an infection. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of medications with kind of a slightly increased risk. The biggest one is the kind of obvious one. Uh, what time is someone taking their diuretic? Yeah. And um So timing of diuretics is by far the the one that I deal with the most. I try to split doses so that they're not having, you know, spreading out some of the diuresis throughout the day. Um, And when is the symptom bothering them the most? Let's not have them take the diuretic right before that, Um, whether it's at night or whether it's in the morning before they go do their daily activities. Um, Let's try to time it a little bit better. I would guess in hospice and palliative medicine that uh, opioids are a fairly frequent uh, cause of some of these symptoms. Uh, I've certainly seen that clinically. Yeah, that um, uh, again, uh, retention type mm-hmm. symptoms, uh, mm-hmm. I think is a common, um, yeah. uh, less so with the kind of storage symptoms. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I want to get your JAGS paper because I think it's really interesting. So you you have these symptoms, you may start treatment after a, a good evaluation. What does it mean for the the person who's having this these symptoms kind of moving forward? 
Yeah. So there's what, what it means for them in terms of their lower urinary tract symptoms. And yeah. we'll kind of put that off to the side. But again, a part of this kind of whole thinking about lower urinary tract symptoms more holistically and what it means for the patients moving forward. I what I observed clinically is that older men with lower urinary tract symptoms tended to have a lot of comorbidities, tended to look or appear or meet the frailty phenotype. And they also tended to do worse than my patients who didn't have lower tract symptoms. And so as a good epidemiologist, I kind of looked for big data sets that might be able to answer that question for me. And so in the Mr. Oss cohort or um, study of osteoporotic fractures in men, I started with a group of uh, almost 3,000 uh, older men who had no difficulties with ambulation no difficulties with uh, managing their money or medications independently, and no difficulties with uh, transfers or bathing or showering. I used the American Neurologic Symptom Index at that visit that they did not report any of these difficulties. And I looked uh, at the next time we were they were asked about mobility and ADL limitations, which uh, was two years later, and I... Um, described what I saw and tried to adjust for all the other reasons somebody might have developed mobility and ADL mm -hmm. limitations during a two-year period. And what I found was that um, just like what we were observing clinically is that uh, older men with more severe symptoms and likely less severe symptoms than one might imagine, it, it you know they weren't all in the category of severe, um, which is an AUA score of 20 or greater, but you start to see increased risk as low as 13 or even eight that they had a twofold increased risk of um, developing new difficulties walking two to three blocks on flat ground or going up 10 stairs without help um, and without rest. And they had also a, you know, men in the, the most severe group had about a 60% increased risk of difficulty uh, with transfers or um, bathing and showering. Um, we didn't see a lot of men developing difficulty with cognitive dependent tasks, like managing medications and money. So yeah. we were pretty limited in, in looking at that outcome. And the chicken and egg here is, so did the ADL and mobility issues cause the lower urinary tract symptoms or did the lower urinary tract symptoms cause the um, mobility and ADL issues? It sounds like everybody didn't have mobility and ADL issues from the start. Does that help us with the chicken and egg? Well, there's one more option, which is something else caused both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to Eric's point, the best way to prevent there being reverse causation is to start with a nice group of people who don't have your outcome at baseline, which is why cross-sectional studies are so limited with studying these kinds of questions. So we, we did our best there. They could have had mobility limitations before, and they just happened to say at that visit that they no longer had them. So I, yeah. you know, you can't prove that. But um, I would say we we did a decent job of of, of making sure that that wasn't the case. Um, and then, absolutely, uh, Chrissy, we uh, are limited to what they reported they developed during that two year period. So we, um, you know, adjusted for new development of any sort of comorbidities that are known to cause lower urinary tract symptoms, new diabetes, new heart failure. Um, uh, diuretic medication use, and uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So those are definitely things that we had to keep in mind and we did our best to account for, but um, there are always um, limitations to our ability. That to, information uh, change your practice at all? Yeah, it. I think it gave me confidence to do what I was already starting to do, which is to stop thinking about lower urinary tract symptoms as a prostate-specific problem and yeah. to think... This is an older man who's at risk of doing, uh, developing outcomes that are really important to avoid in older men. And um, I need to, you know, double down on making sure that this isn't an early sign of one of those conditions. Yeah. Um, and I need to think very carefully about is the medication I'm giving them not only uh, is it going to be helpful for their symptom, and is it going to? They're already even independent of the medication I'm giving them at higher risk of having new mobility problems and ADL limitations, is it the medication I'm giving them going to help prevent that or make it worse? And yeah. several of the BPH medications um, are very strongly associated with falls and orthostatic hypotension. So the alpha blockers? That's yeah, alpha blockers. And finasteride, there's increasing concern about incident depression in, in men who start finasteride um, mm. at the doses we use for BPH. So um, again, there's just 
not only is it maybe not going to help, but it's um, in some men going to hurt. We should just move a little more slowly, be a little bit more thoughtfully and really consider deprescribing after a period of time to see if the symptoms really were better because of the medicine, or maybe they were better because of regression to the mean, like Chrissy mentioned. Mm -hmm. I love this study. I thought it was really a, an important reminder that, you know, people are people. It's all, all these systems are connected and that we really, you know, maybe LUT severity really should help be a flag for us that there's, there might be something going on here and we don't want to just, again, get those blinders on. So I, I thought it's great work. Thanks. And maybe one day we will get to the point of how providers are thinking about their pr prescribing habits around treating lower energetic symptoms, which is, you know, uh, where Chrissy's work is, uh, you know, further down the road. But uh, I think um, a natural direction of this kind of, uh, these kinds of studies. Downstream, so to speak. <laughs> ah. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, a cascading true. problem with prescribing here. That. <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. But before we end, I think Alex is gearing up for a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> let it go. Let it go. Everyone should join in on the chorus. We should all join in. Yo, we, there's a bad delay with Zoom. There's so a delay, but you works. should join in anyway because it's fun. You should do it. You should <laughs> do it. I'll mute myself and join in. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let them in, don't let them see Be the good girl you always have to be Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know Well now they know Let it go, let it go Can't hold it in anymore Oh, let it go Turn away and slam the door and I don't care what they're going to say Let the storm rage on The cold never bothered her anyway <laughs> Yay! Awesome. Scott, Chrissy, huge thank you for joining us. That was a great conversation. Learned a lot. And uh, really, we'll have links to the JAGS papers um, and some of the other stuff we talked about on our show notes. So very big thank you for joining us today. Thank you guys thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, as always, thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. And to all of our listeners, thank you very much. We'd also like to thank the generous support from our listeners who've donated $250 or more to the Jerry Powell podcast, including... Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lunderberg, Gail Cooney, David Schiffling, Cheryl Phillips, Jessica Ng, Harry Hahn, Elizabeth Chung, Kathy Foley, Rochelle Bernacki, Christine Ritchie, and Lloyd Wolstadt. Thank you very much.